So, hi, thanks a lot for showing up here. Um, like she said, my, my work has to do with how animals live in the human imagination. It's a sort of cultural history of animals. And um, so I, I do a lot of reading and research, and I get most of my ideas from that. Um, there's this sort of process of, of sometimes just uh, looking around for things that will inspire me in a general way, reading about natural history subjects. But also, uh, sometimes you just stumble on things. Um, often when I'm researching a particular thing, uh, I'll let a sort of hypnagogic uh, imagination thing kick in. Uh, because I'm not looking for a literal illustration of a text I'm reading or anything like that. I'm looking for something, um, a, an image that's going to grab you. Um, and they, occasionally it does form a sort of, sometimes it is almost just strictly an illustration. In this case, it more or less is. Um, so I'll talk a, a little about how I work. That's really what I'm going to do now. I'm not going to talk to a particular subject. But just the fact that it's a sort of human cultural tradition of painting animals and thinking about animals that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in painting a nature picture of an animal existing outside of human culture. To me, it's like the movie King Kong, which I was obsessed with as a little kid. The 1932 version where you have a proper stalker. <laughs> King Kong, you don't have this friendly King Kong that makes friends with the girl. It's actually a horrific relationship. The story doesn't get going until Fay Ray shows up. There isn't really a story there. It's just Kong walking around. What does he do? He doesn't even kill dinosaurs if she's not around. He doesn't do anything. So I'm not interested in that story. I'm interested in the story after these knuckleheads show up and start making a mess on the island. And, um, and, and that's always been what interested me. So uh, let's see. This painting that's up here is 10 feet by 5 feet, actually. And it's a, um, a watercolor on paper. None of my things are on canvas. People are always saying that canvas. But that's a sheet of paper. It's much bigger than the actual projected image here. Um, the line is life size. I paint all my animals life size. I want them to be sort of in the room with you, you know, a presence, you know. Uh, Audubon painted his animals life size, so I was interested in that. Um, so I was reading a story in the Panchatantra, which is, I actually named my monograph after this. Uh, the Panchatantra is probably the oldest animal fable book on the planet. It's an Indian, it's a collection of Indian, um, uh, subcontinental Indian stories uh, 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 that often have animals in them, um, not always. More like a, it's a, it was the source for easy, it, many things like a Aesop's fables. These are ancient stories. And in this story, it's uh, about uh, three scholars and their simple-minded friend. And they're walking in the woods, and the three scholars find a skeleton. And they say, oh, I, I, I'm going to show my great learning um, by, by, by reassembling this skeleton, the first one says. So he says some incantations. These guys are, are, are sadhus, so they have access to godly power. So they... They say some incantations and the skeleton it assembles itself. And then the next says, I believe I can put flesh and, and everything on this thing. And so he, he does that. And he, he, he brings, he, and suddenly the simple minded uh, friend of theirs realizes it's a lion that they're bringing into the world again from the skeleton. And so he runs away and climbs the tree. And the next, because the next guy says inevitably, I can bring it back to life. And of course he brings it back to life and he eats them. So it's this sort of very first Frankenstein story, you know. Um, so just the moment of the reanimation of this creature is the one that I wanted to put in. But I was also interested in a sort of Renaissance tradition where you show different stages of the story. So I was, um, you know, in the background you see the, the sadhus are reassembling the skeleton and the, and the simpleton is running away. Um, so that's more or less a straight up illustration version and so I have actually some fancy art people have been like 
you know, what makes your work not illustration? And I'm like, nothing, it is illustration. And so is the Renaissance, you know what I mean? So is the, so is everything Michelangelo did. But how, how why, I mean, I've said this before, but I'll say it here. How, why is Michelangelo's Say Last Judgment interesting? Because he painted about the male naked form. That was his subject. It wasn't about the Last Judgment. It was about him being gay and him wanting to paint men in naked men all over a church wall. So then it's like, and call it the Last Judgment. You know, so <laughs> this idea of being an illustrator, say, you, when I was at art school, that was frowned upon. I bet you kids today don't even care because it just doesn't make any difference. So yeah, whatever, I'm an illustrator. But this isn't an illustration. Now this gets more into my hypnagogic thing that I was talking about. So I read about Cabeza de Vaca. Does anyone know about who, who, who he was? Cabeza de Vaca was a Spanish conquistador who was shipwrecked in Florida. And he basically spent the next 10 years trying to get back to some Spanish settlement somewhere. We're talking like 1515 or something like this. And so he's, he's, he walked from Florida to Mexico City, essentially. But he also was enslaved at different times. He also passed himself off as a shaman at different times and healed people and stuff to get through. And by the time he was rediscovered by the Spaniards, he was, uh, you know, he was, he was unrecognizable as a European, you know. And um, he, he was found by a slaving party. He was actually found by Spaniards who were enslaving Native Americans, and he was with his friends who were all Native Americans, and they were rounding them up when he's like, I'm, I'm a Spaniard, you know, and they're like, holy mackerel. And so that story stayed with me. He wrote it all down, but in a very terse, kind of frustratingly not detailed way, because he was the first European to see any of this stuff, the Southwest and all of this. Everywhere he went, there would have been rattlesnakes. The, some of the worst in Florida, Eastern Diamondbacks, but every, every kind of rattlesnake. So my idea, and there's no rattlesnakes in Europe. So my idea of his post-traumatic nightmare would have been this. He's up on the bluff. He, there's Cabeza de Vaca looking over the edge of this cliff. And the rattlesnakes made one, like 30 miles long or something. And there's California condors flying around it. And it's this, this, this world. It. And, the, and it's like a kind of Big Ben, Texas type of landscape, you know. So, and this, again, is a 10 foot by 5 foot painting. And, and, and I don't know if anyone knows who Larry Gagosian is, but this of thing is in, his, this is, is in his bedroom. <laughs> I say, in the Hamptons, I say, nothing says summer fun like a, a 10 foot painting of a 30 mile long rattlesnake. He goes, it works for me. So that's some. So these stories I read, I read about. Okay, so you can see that what I was saying before about the last one. I did a ton of research, and I, for 10 years I'm trying to think, how the hell am I going to paint the Cabeza de Vaca story? And then, I don't know, man. Thank God for the hypnagogic state, you know? Because right between waking and sleeping, you jump up and you write something that you're like, ah, how did I not think of that? This is, uh, uh, there was a, a, a guy called Sil... I'm going to tell the stories. Is that all right? Sir William Hamilton, he was a, he was a, 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 Vulcan, a vol, volcano expert, but also one of the first uh, people to sort of introduce uh, Greco-Roman traditions back into like English, like federal style stuff. He, he, we're talking about an 18th century guy that was the ambassador to Naples and was involved in digging up things in Pompeii. And he collected this big, collection of beautiful classical things like vases and stuff. And he influenced the, the, the sort of uh, neoclassical movement. And, and he was also married to Emma Hamilton, who was a very wild woman who had Lord Nelson as her lover and blah, blah, blah. And, and Susan Sontag wrote an, a rather unsuccessful novel about it. But there's some good um, history to be read about these people. And he had a monkey called Jack. 
And he described the monkey, and I realized, holy shit, I know what kind of monkey that is. It, it was because of his description, it was a, this, this particular type of, of, of macaque, um, lion-tailed macaque, because he describes it quite well. And Jack was wild. Jack would grab people by their genitals and smell his fingers. And he was an outrageous monkey. And William Hamilton was a diplomat, a very controlled British guy, so he got a big kick out of having this sort of Corchester monkey. And when Jack died, he was totally blown in grief, you know. So I was interested in Jack as a sort of, just to paint his spirit, like what kind of thing that William Hamilton comes around the corner. And also William Hamilton was an intrepid dis, uh, explorer of volcanoes. He would, he would climb up, Vesuvius was erupting when he was there, and he would go walking, you know, burn his feet walking across the stuff. There's a great Werner Herzog documentary now about these volcano people, but he was one of the early versions of that. Um, so anyhow, this just, he's got a, he's got a, 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 a dildo that would have been dug up in, in Pompeii, which actually William Hamilton had, and he's broken the telescope, and he's just out of control. <laughs> I've done a series of paintings about this monkey. I'm not done with him yet. <laughs> I was reading, totally not expecting any kind of natural history image. I was just reading uh, a writer's di a diary by Virginia Woolf, just because she's Virginia Woolf. You'll want to read everything she ever wrote, if you like her, and I do. And she, she wrote one day, at, on her 48th birthday, she said, I was out walking in the downs, and she says something to the effect, of, maybe it's even here because I have such a great studio manager, he probably has a quote. Yeah, I am 48, we have been in Rodmel, a wet windy day again, but on my birthday we walked among the downs like the folded wings of gray birds and saw first one fox, very long with his brush stretched, and then a second which had been barking for the sun was hot over us. It leapt lightly over a, over a fence and entered the firs, a very rare sight. How many foxes are there in England? Mm. Ah, she can't write a bad sentence. She's just jotting stuff down, right? So I thought the one stretched out running in the rain and the one barking in the sun, and that was her mental illness for me. Mm. I was like, oh yeah, that's what, that's what it feels like. You know, the, the, and the running in the rain, which you would think is the depression, is maybe more calm because that's when you sort of focus, you know? And then the barking in the sun is the sort of manic upstate where you're like really afraid for the person that you love who has this kind of thing. And, and she, and I did the view, you can see down to where she drowned herself in the, in the rainy part of the picture, down in the river valley there. So I just wanted to paint her mental state. And what I didn't realize I was doing that somebody told me much later, they're like, look at how much Van Gogh you put in the grass. And I was like, I didn't even notice I was doing that. But it made sense. It was like, oh, of course, those were the marks you do with that kind of turmoil. So this is one where I wasn't even researching for a painting, and all of a sudden this image came to me, and I was like, I don't need to work it. I got so excited, I, I, wrote, I did a sketch right in the book. And, um, and I knew immediately when it, it came all in my head at once that it would be the whole afternoon in one painting. And that you would read the time the same way you read a sentence, you would read it. You would read it in, you know. And then along the top, I, I have the entire quote written so that you read across her day. And that's it. I wish I could show it to her. Um, this is from a, a, I got, I don't think I have too many more slides, do I? So I'm not using, am I using up too much time? Am I all right? Tell me, like, do the hook. You're perfect, I will. I all right, will. Thank So you. far you're perfect, you're within, the, you're within the time zone. Wow. Believe it or not. All right, yeah. we'll see. Um, uh, 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 this guy, Eric Newby, um, he wrote a book called A Short Walk in the Hindu Kush. In 1958, he was a he was a fashion executive that decided to climb a mountain in the in the in the Hindu Kush, which is insane. 
I mean, he, he wasn't shape, he wasn't a mountaineer, he was just a nut. And he was bored with his life, and he decided he was going to do this thing. And then he wrote a hilarious book about it, a very dark humor book about how completely messed up his expedition to the Hindu Kush was, and his crazy friends that he brought with him. So, so he asked, and they, they got to the mountain they intended to climb, and, 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 and Eric asked a native, like a local person, what's the deal with that mountain near Samir? And this was the answer. Um, about the name near Samir, no one had any idea at all. No man has been there, was all they could say. Even the Ibex has only trodden there once, and that was in the time of Tufan Inu, when Noah's flood covered the earth. Then the waters rushed up the valley, destroying everything, and so right up to Mir Samir itself. And there, the last Ibex took refuge at the very top, and the water followed up to the very belly of the Ibex, and it rose no more, and after a while began to sink. And ever since that time, the belly of the Ibex has been white. And this is how it came to be. So that's, that gave me an opportunity to sort of do a little illustration. When I read a story like that, I'm like, that sounds like a Walt Ford painting to me. <laughs> so that was easy. But, um, another big 10 foot by 5 foot painting. So I decided I wanted to paint wild boars. And I did some research and found out that wild boars where it's a matriarchy. That the males, the big vicious males, are basically just sperm delivery systems that wander around by themselves and don't help out with any chores or child rearing or anything. And, and, and the Sounds females, familiar. right? Sounds like a lot of people we know. Um, yeah, talk to my first wife, definitely. And, um, um, so that interested me, you know. Uh, how, how do I, how do I think about that? So again, you know, you're you're relying on just that funny dream state, and it, I realized that I would have a male that was either dying or just resting or just somehow completely passive, and he'd be a sort of lectern for the for the wild boar school that the that the matriarch was running, and this painting's called the matriarch. So. I, I don't know. I, and then the, there are males being chased and murdered by dogs in the background, so that you know they don't even look that that's their job is to get killed by dogs. Um, so anyhow, that one happened. Cute little guys, right? Yes. I know. I had fun painting that. And then this is I sometimes go right into the most uh, uh, outrageously unrealistic, I mean this would fit right in with the title of this unnatural thing, whatever. I thought about what if flying monkeys in the Wizard of Oz were actually real? What would happen? So I made up an entire story about, in my head, about real, honest to God, flying monkeys that had evolved in the Congo to fly. And I even made up a, the idea of a trainer, of a animal trainer, an imaginary animal trainer, and I wrote a text down the side of where the grass is there. You can barely see. It's pretty bad quality slides. Sorry about all that, but you're just going to have to buy my next book. Um, uh, so I'm going to read this because it's self-explanatory. I've been, this is a quote from a, I made up a guy called Ben G. Fisher because I did find, I found the name of a monkey trainer who, who ran a place called Monkey Island in LA during the same time that they were making The Wizard of Oz. So I imagined that he actually knew where to get real flying monkeys to bring into The Wizard of Oz set, and he could he was hired to train them. And so this is his text, which I made up, but I like it. I've been training performing animals since vaudeville days. So when The Wizard of Oz was in the works, I got the call. Fleming was determined to use real flying monkeys from the Congo. That was MGM in those days, never cutting corners. But even Treflick in New York was only able to find about a dozen animals. Very rare, those monkeys, even then. The script called for an army, hundreds, so right away things got balled up. 
Anyhow, I happen to like flying monkeys. They're smart and quite gentle, but nobody, I mean nobody, can train a dozen of flying formation. I had just two days to work with them before the first scene, and it was bedlam. Right off, they just flew all over Lisette like pigeons, landing on the equipment, pulling the place apart. Of course, after that, Fleming used little people in monkey costumes, and I got the breeze after four thankless days. No screen credit, naturally. I remember hearing that Louis B. Mayer kept the finest looking flying monkey for a little while as a pet. The original Nico, I guess. In any case, I was on to the next thing by then, over on Kawenga with Louis Weiss helping set up Monkey Island. Another wacky story for another day. Bert G. Fisher. That's, that's my imaginary guy who trained the monkeys. So, Nico, it is called the original Nico. Nico was the name in the credits, actually, for the main scary monkey. I mean, I was so traumatized by those monkeys when I was little, but I like the idea of thinking about it. Like, the actual flying monkey, if you had such a thing, wouldn't be some malevolent henchman of a witch. He would be, so they would have had to act. They would have to pretend. The actual monkey is just there. It just wants a nice piece of fruit. It doesn't want to be bothered. You know, it's perfectly fine. And, you know, so my idea is this is a sort of, Louis B. Mayer has this to show the girls, you know, like he's picked, you know, the casting couch, you know, hey, check out the flying monkey and come on in, darling, you know, we'll get you apart, you know. So this kind of thing. So that's my show done. <laughs> so if you liked, if you liked what you just heard, and I did. You'll probably hate what I'm about to do because it's <laughs> so unbelievably different that it's uh, hard to imagine anything could be more different. But anyway, it says there what an owl taught me about connecting. And most of us live very disconnected from the natural world. And by the way, I know the, the people in the back who said you had to leave, if you have to leave, you have to leave. I'm not going to be insulted. I, <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'll be insulted. I just <laughs> won't hold it against you for long. <laughs> so most of us live really disconnected, and this is a story about reconnecting. A few years ago, somebody found a dying baby bird on their lawn and sent me a text message saying, do you know what this is? And at first I, I had to squint at it because I thought it looked like a dead washcloth, not a, <laughs> not a bird. And then I realized, oh, that's a baby owl. Aww. And uh, is it dead? No, it wasn't dead. And the person who sent me that text was a wildlife rehabber, but she knew that I knew a lot about owls and I had done a lot of wildlife rehabbing. And, and so she immediately started to consult with me. And I was working with her a little bit. She did a great job oh. of stabilizing oh. that. Oh. And nice. then, uh, to make a longer story a little bit shorter, this, <coughs> this little owl came to oh. thrive oh. and came to live with us. So good. And the idea was that we were going to just do a soft release in my backyard pretty naturally right around the time this owl started flying. But her flight was delayed because basically all the feathers on her wing did not come in on time. And I knew from past experience that sometimes with a near-death baby bird, they don't molt correctly, their feathers don't go correctly. So I decided that we needed, to, we couldn't just let her flop around in the backyard, she couldn't fly. We couldn't let her flop around. She'd get like one night of that. And um, so we decided that she had to be held in a uh, protective custody until she went through a molt. And I knew what was going to happen and if she was going to actually be OK and be able to fly. And oh, when she molted, wow. she looked like that. And oh. she was just stunning Beautiful. and perfect, perfect in the way that many creatures are. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, by that time it was almost winter, and I couldn't just let her go in the winter when the food was at its all-time low. So we kept her until it got warm again, and then I started getting her in shape for the eventual release. And I used to be a falconer, and I knew how to do these kinds of things. Wow. And it wasn't just exercise, it was also a little bit of training for how to catch food. Like, you don't have to teach a kitten to chase things, but 
Something that is trying to get away and not be caught requires skill. So I would pull a fake mouse on a string with some food attached, and this little bird that we named Alfie uh, started to develop some of her skills in those ways. And then so eventually, cool. eventually, wow. we let her stay out, and we, and we left the door open. And my big, big fear, of course, was she was totally safe in that coop. And she was totally comfortable in that coop. But that's not a life. It's not a life for anybody. An owl that's not out doing owly things is just a bird in a cage. And we'll never have any chance of being part of the great chain of being. On the other hand, um, it's very dangerous out there. And my fear was that because she could, she could fly really well, it wasn't like a young one that is learning and eventually widens their circle, that she would just bolt, disappear, and starve. That was my fear. And in fact, she disappeared for a week. And I thought, oh, I guess that's that. And then a week later, I, I, was, I was actually um, on, a, on a long trip, and uh, I got a text from my wife at four in the morning where I was, and it's, this text said, guess who's back? Oh, Alfie wow. Had, Alfie had returned. That's so great. <laughs> Now, oh. <laughs> in, the, in the ensuing months oh. now, I had become exceptionally, exceptionally fond of this little <laughs> being. And she was oh. no longer to me a bird or an owl. She was Alfie. She had a history. The history made us have a relationship. And how do we know who we are? We know who we are by our relationships, by knowing who is with us and who we are around. And so that's what we had. And this is not a trick picture. I didn't have food in my mouth or anything. <laughs> I, she just came down low enough for me to give her a little head rub. And then, I, and then she started preening my cheek. And I thought, well, let me get my camera ready. And I, I, I took a selfie. That's a selfie. And I turned to her and I pursed my lips. And that's what I got. Aww. Very, very sweet and very, very nice, obviously. but. A love triangle. <laughs> <laughs> a girl who looks like that is not going to be single for long. <laughs> she almost immediately attracted uh, a wild suitor. Uh, and here things really got really interesting for me because I used to study birds for a living, study bird behavior of wild birds. And I was taught, and as far as I knew, I had seen that breeding starts with a courtship phase. And there are postures and songs, and then there are the proper responses to postures and songs. And it's all kind of mechanical and instinctive, and it just is a phase, a category. And that is not what was going on with them. Now, the thing is, this was the year that COVID shut us all down. And my calendar got completely erased, like I'm sure yours did. And so I had nothing better to do than to watch Alfie and her suitor, who we called Plus One, <laughs> in my backyard for about five hours a day. I would get up a little before dawn. I'd go find her in her normal roost site. I'd watch what they did. I did the same thing at sunset. A lot of people say, how can you possibly watch owls for five hours a day? Well, you watch television for five hours a day. <laughs> and some of you work in cubicles for eight hours a day. Those are two things that would kill me. But owl watching maybe could kill you. I like it. So I don't think there was anything much better to do yeah. than to have all those hours to be at home. And if I had a normal year where we're all sort of disconnected from our fragmented lives, I never would have seen a developing relationship, not a courtship phase. Alfie was completely afraid of him at first, and they were very tentative with each other. And I saw the development of trust, and he offering her these little gifts of food, like that's a moth, and she not taking them at first, and then taking them sometimes, and then seeing them 
resting on a branch near each other. So this was the development of trust and a bond, not a courtship phase. Another thing that I learned when I was a professional ornithologist is that birds have no way to, uh, they have no facial expressions. You can't see anything by looking at the face of the bird. Well, obviously that's wrong, because look at him. <laughs> he said, I never really liked you, and I still don't. <laughs> and she's like singing in her head, I feel pretty. <laughs> Completely relaxed and in our love. I mean, I know this is amusing, but it's also very, very profound. Because these are the lives that are happening around us all the time. We don't know they're there. We never think about it. And to the extent that we do, we just say, oh, I saw an owl. It's a category. It's not, it's not a life. But really, it is a life. And then, of course, one thing led to another. You all remember those days. And they took a box, they got interested in a box that I put right outside my writing studio. My, my writing desk is right inside the window there. Uh, and that's my lovely wife, uh, who wishes she was here today, because I texted her some pictures of how great the exhibits in the gallery are. And she's looking for plus one, and that's Alfie looking out the nest box. So when we had this tame owl, we could see at point blank range all the lives that we normally miss around us. Mm. Now, I, at, at one point, she started the courtship and the mating that was finished, and she was in the box all the time. So I thought, okay, so she's probably laid a clutch of eggs, which of course I was hoping for. Oh, and one other thing I forgot to mention is that when birds mate, they, the female has to assume a, a particular very correct posture so that the fertilization can occur. And she was not doing that at first. She was very awkward, she was inexperienced. And then one night, I saw her do it right, and after that, it was right all the time after that. And then I thought, okay, so if she lays eggs, I think there's a good chance that they will be fertilized. So I was really afraid, as tame as she was, I was still afraid to climb a ladder and bother her in that box. I thought, this has to be a place she thinks is inviolate and really safe. But um, I realized that she was coming out each evening to take a bath. And, and I had like five minutes while she went to the bath and then she would come out, wipe herself off, do a little spin cycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I could put a ladder up quickly, go up there, and see what's in the box. Nice. And I was delighted to see that there were eggs. These eggs are normal. They happen all the time. How often do we see eggs in a wild bird's nest? All these miracles that just pass us, pass us, pass us. And they were fertile, and they all hatched. Oh, wow. Now, to show you how small newly hatched screech owls are, wow. that's three owls on the top, and that's a mouse on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the mouse plus one, I guess, and that's all the litter. So they were tiny, and the parents were really, really good parents. At first, when they were little, they brought them little things, mostly, and then they brought them bigger things when they were growing. You see one there pick, poking their head out. Mm. And one of the adults, probably the father, bringing a sparrow. And they were growing, growing. And then they fledged. They fledged into a world that was not exactly welcoming. The first morning they were out, they got very rough treatment from the neighboring blue jays. This this jay knocked that young one out of the tree about four different times. Wow. If you ever find a baby owl on the ground, you would assume, like I would assume, like I did assume, that they're totally helpless on the ground. And what I found was that baby wow. owls can walk straight up tree trunks. Wow. 
every one of these things I'm showing you, you would never, never mm. be able to see mm -hmm. if you didn't have a tame owl who was completely trusting mm. and having her life right around you. And she was a really good mother. Mm. You probably also know that when there are various young birds in a nest, they are always famished and they're always fighting for the food and the weak ones starve. Well, no. She would turn to the right and feed one, she turned to the left and feed the other. When the young ones were full, they would just not want any more food. Sometimes they'd actually hop away from her while she was still trying to feed them. Every one of them got more than enough, more than she had. Uh, no, not more than, she had more than they wanted. Mm. And they all thrived. Wow. wow. And they all knew who they were. <laughs> they knew exactly who they were, they knew where, they knew who mom and dad were, they knew where home was. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's I, so good. I told my wife that, you know, we had the names for Alfie and Plus One, and I wanted to name all the young ones. And, um, but then I realized I can't tell them apart. So she said, well, <laughs> well, we'll just have a group name. We'll call them the Who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was, it, was, it was Alfie Plus One and the Who. Uh, <laughs> that's so good. Now, this is supposed to be a video. No, we can. Yeah. It's going. It's going. It's going. Listen, uh, listen, listen, if you can, because I don't hear any sound. Uh, I can hear a little bit. Yeah. Oh. Watch this. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh. Is this one of the who? Or this no, is this is Alfie. Alfie. Wow. And this is Alfie, and I'll tell you a little backstory on that particular little video. First of all, you couldn't really hear it, but at one point she did what I call the cozy call, where she goes, that's the most intimate sound they make. You will never feel, you'll, you never see that in any field guide, because when you're out bird watching, they're not intimate with you, because mm. they're just wild owls. All right. Now, I, during the breeding season, I did not try to interact with her. I tried not to interact with her, actually. And so she would be focused on her family, not me. But the third year she was loose, in 2021, no, 2022, 2022, her mate didn't return that year. He returned for two years. And in both of those years, they raised three chicks each year. And then the third year, something happened to him, and he did not come back. And that was, that was a very sad and lonely year for her and for me. But she laid four eggs, but they were not fertile. Mm -hmm. And she sat on them for about a week longer than they normally would take to hatch. And then when she was hormonally geared to be caring for young ones, there weren't any. And during that little span of the springtime is when she came down and we had that interaction. And you saw the way she leaned into and closed her eyes, just like a dog might do. And would you ever have thought that an owl is capable of that feeling of trust and bonding and recognition? Because I wouldn't have really thought so. But uh, you imprinted on her because she well, was so young. So this is another thing, is that people know this word imprint, and they think that imprint means that they don't know what they are or who they are. But she responded completely normally to the wild owls. She didn't think she was a person. She just knew who I was. She knew who my wife was. She knew our dogs. And if a friend came with a strange dog, the strange dogs freaked her out completely. She knew who she was, and she knew who she had relationships with. The people, the dogs, her wild mate, her, her children. She knew, she, the recognition was completely there. There was no confusion about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and we were in that confusion. circle. I didn't mean confusion. I mean, 
she bonded with you during that critical period where imprinting of birds does occur? Yeah, right? but I would say, um, you know, I would say she was not imprinted. She was tame. Because imprinted means you think you're that. That's the classic imprinting. The ducklings follow the people around because they think the people are their mother. But that's not really how it was with this. Okay. It was just, she was just very, very flexible in, in her recognition and her reactions to all of the ones that she knew. As I said, humans, owls, dogs. So I, I would not call that imprinting. She was just tame. That's, that's how I see it. So, <coughs> this raised a question for me that I thought was mm. a really foundational question, which is why, is any, is this, why does any of this surprise us? Mm. These creatures have been in our world since before we were in the world. Mm -hmm. Why don't we know about it? Why, why are we so disconnected? Is it a limitation of our human minds, or are we taught our disconnection? It turns out that indigenous people, South Asian religions, East Asian philosophies, all have very similar things to say about the human place in nature, in the world, and, and in the cosmos. And those, the similarity is that all the other beings have equivalent souls, mm -hmm. that all the other beings are our relatives or our ancestors. There's certainly almost, you know, I would say all the indigenous land-based traditional people speak like that of their relationship to the land and other living things. The <coughs> South Asian religions with their ideas of karma have equivalent souls that go through e equally the different kinds of life and experience all of those things. And the, and the East Asian philosophies like Taoism uh, <coughs> and Confucianism, it's all about the necessary opposites of the world create unity in their balance. So in other words, you can't have up unless you have down. You can't have forward without back. You can't have life without death. And maintaining the balance in the world is the responsibility and the role of human people. Or, or more to the point, not upsetting the balance is the responsibility of human people. And then, in ancient Greece, a different story arose, a very, very different story. And that is that humans are better than everything in the world, that humans are actually better than the world because the whole rest of the world is here for us, mm. for us to use, to serve us, <laughs> Maybe even to use the world up. Mm -hmm. That's very different. So a philosopher named Kristen Sartwell wrote in the New York Times, our devaluation and disconnection from animals is the originating idea of Western thought and its worth, worst idea. Mm -hmm. In that scheme, we owe nature nothing. It is to yield us everything. Mm -hmm. That's the sun at midday last July. The same day that my stepdaughter called and said, I think our house is on fire because I just looked outside and all I see is smoke. Mm -hmm. And I had to tell her the good news is our house is not on fire, Canada is on fire. <laughs> when that's the good news, <coughs> you know the end of that sentence. Trees are the fastest and least expensive way to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but we're letting the trees burn across Canada, across the West, in the Amazon, in Australia. And in that world, the, the perpetrators take record profits while having no responsibility. Now, even the nice people among us want everyone to have their rights. We have the Bill of Rights. We have the UN Declaration of Human Rights. We want everyone to have their rights. There's no bill of responsibilities, though. We don't need to think about that. There's no declaration of responsibilities. All we want is rights. We don't want responsibilities. Mm -hmm. 
And this is happening because the world has no value in our system. Because we decided in ancient Greece that the world has no value. <coughs> that to me is not a very good reason. 50 years of climate talks, all of those agreements, and you can see what's happening with the carbon dioxide, those agreements made no difference at all because nobody really took them seriously. We take almost half of the land for making food to say nothing of the trillions of animals that we yank out of the ocean every year with predictable results. Since the first Earth Day over there in the lower left, wildlife populations have just continued, continued to decline. Since I was in high school, quarter of the birds in North America have disappeared. That's something, if you're a birder, is very noticeable, especially during migrations. And especially, I live on Long Island, so on the coast in the fall, it's very noticeable. 70% of all the birds in the world are now basically chickens. And a few ducks and a few turkeys. And 96% of all the mammals are what we call live stock and human beings. Not a balanced picture. We don't know about or feel or think about these calamities because our education <coughs> gives us our disconnection. We, we are taught our disconnection. We get a diploma, we say congratulations, you've graduated, and at that time we don't know where our food comes from, where our water, our energy comes from, how our energy is made, how it gets to us, where any of the material of our lives comes from, where our waste goes, or what lives around us. We don't know anything about the context of our lives, but we've been told we graduated, because what did we learn? We learned how to shop. We were indoctrinated into a cult <laughs> called consumerism. And what are we? We're not people, we're not human beings, we're, not, we're, we're consumers, that's what, that's what we're called. We're called consumers, that's our value. To buy things, to shop and to buy things is our value. And that means to live disconnected from our consequences. That's what being a consumer is. It is to be disconnected from our consequences. So what would it look, look like to love the world instead? We think technology needs to get us out of this, but the tech revolutions that are needed will require first a revolution in values. And that's because all technology serves the values that create it. Moral revolutions always seem unlikely until they happen. And we've had a whole bunch of moral revolutions. Really big ones, small ones, but these are all values changes. And they have created the only real human progress that we've had. And the thing about values is that values are the most scalable thing because we take them everywhere and we use them for everything. So it's time to retire that old guy and that stupid story that says that you are better than the world and embrace the reality of how it really is. Now that's a simple diagram that shows that everything that's here around us has made an enormous trip to be here today with us, including ourselves. But if you try to wrap your mind around the real full reality of life and time, it immediately is completely overwhelming to our human understanding. And so to try to do that can seem like a religious thing. <laughs> I'm serious, but I have a sense of humor. Yeah. The Pope thinks it's religious. 
Paul Greenberg, who was here talking with James and I last time, and I both think it can be religious, mm -hmm. or it can simply be a very practical and really literal endeavor. Maybe we don't have to have the landscape be completely occupied with us. Maybe we can let some other animals live and move. We can connect fragments for everything from elephants to migrating crabs, if we ever care to think about it, and if we want to. In Chicago, last month, a thousand birds died after colliding with one building during migration, that building had been asked to turn the lights down and they just didn't care. New York City had a similar problem with their 9-11 tribute a few years ago and it turned out that just shutting the lights for 20 minutes every hour let them reorient and pass instead of circle until they were exhausted and died. Philadelphia has decided that they're going to literally give the birds a pass so what do you do with all of this on Monday morning, tomorrow morning? <laughs> well, you can just start with a desire to see the world reconnected instead of fragmented and to elevate ourselves from merely transactional beings that we've been taught to be to the relational beings that every other philosophy, every other religious tradition, every other wisdom tradition in the history of the world taught its people. Anything you're doing, you can do it with the whole world in mind if you choose. So maybe we don't have to have half the world for growing food. Maybe we can grow food with 99% less space and water and fertilizers. And my dream is connecting abundance, human dignity, beauty and the future in everything that we do. It's, it's our values that might save the world. So, welcome back to the world. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, it's an honor to be here with two people that I, speaking with two people that I greatly admire, um, who have uh, enriched my own work over the years uh, by knowing them. And uh, yeah, I think there are aspects of what I'm going to say that uh, relate to both uh, Walton and Carl's work. But I, I start a lot of my talks with this slide. I grew up in southwestern Connecticut, uh, up against the drinking water reservoir. And as a kid, um, I was introduced to nature by, through my father, through his love of birds. He grew up in Brazil and fell in love with birds as a kid down there and brought that love of birds with him to this country, originally to New Rochelle, New York. And um, I, uh, so I, I had an introduction to nature and I, I would wander out. And, and at the end of our dead end street, um, you encounter these you know, trespassing signs around the, the watershed land that's supposed to protect uh, the Eastern Reservoir. So in the early part of the 20th century, 19-teens, 1905, 1910, the Bridgeport Hydraulic Company, Bridgeport, Connecticut was a growing industrial city. They thought it was gonna be a city of maybe a million people. It's still around 300,000 uh, because the industry left, but they, the leaders of the city, which included um, P.T. Barnum, who was actually the owner of the water company and the mayor of Bridgeport, so it was a little bit of a corrupt cronyism thing. They took it through a few uh, river valleys through eminent domain, pushed the farmers out and flooded the valley. So my, my street, Ketchell Street in Easton, Connecticut, I live on, by the way, a few houses away from the house where I grew up, uh, was cut off from the rest of town when they flooded the Mill River Valley. So the street now dead ends on the Eastern Reservoir. And when I was a kid, I would wander down the street and encounter these no trespassing signs. But of course, for a, a, a nine-year-old boy um, or girl, <laughs> uh, depending on your disposition, a no trespassing sign is like a welcome here sign. So, and once you pass the other side, 
you can't read the signs. So <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite stanzas from the 120 stanzas of This Land is Your Land by Woody Guthrie is, um, as I was walking, I saw a sign there, and on the sign it said, no trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> but um, I realized over the years that this no trespassing sign has, is, a, is good an illustration, the word Walton used, of what I've been trying to communicate as, as any I can find. Because I remember when they switched these signs, the old ones said no trespassing, hunting, trapping, or fishing. But there was a point in the 1980s when nobody knew what trapping was anymore. And they put up new signs that said, no hunting, swimming, or fishing. So I remember, I'm 48, I was maybe 40 years ago when they switched these signs. And since then, the sugar maple has started to grow around the sign and actually obscure the no and trespassing, and welcoming <laughs> um, me to come in. But, uh, and at the base of the tree, I think I have a picture, oops. Uh, you can't really see that well, but there's barbed wire that the tree has swallowed and other boundaries. So I thought as a kid, you know, deer and turkeys and squirrels can cross this line. Why Why can't I? It just didn't make any sense. So so I did cross the boundary, but it led to, a, in some ways, I reflect in, in, in retrospect, a lifelong inquiry about lines that humans draw in the landscape that animals don't know are there, but they can influence the fates of these animals. Um, but the other reminder is that all of our boundaries are ultimately ephemeral. Nature eventually takes them back. As indelible as the border wall between the um, United States and Mexico it may seem, one day it will come down. And that's, to me, a refreshing uh, thought. And we'll, we'll all be dead one day. <laughs> um, I, uh, like Walton, started drawing as a little kid. I was copying Audubon, in this case, Roger Tory Peterson. I think this was a warbler that no longer exists in the nomenclature of Bachman's warbler. <laughs> um, and then I, uh, my drawings turned from birds to fish when I um, fell in love with fishing and trout around the age of nine years old. A, a friend of mine introduced me to fishing. And we would go, because we had access to these illegal watersheds fishing in the reservoirs, and they were great fishing because nobody was allowed to fish there. <laughs> uh, and I, I eventually got caught fishing illegally by a game warden named Joe Haynes, who became a very important mentor to me. And, uh, and, it, and again, in, on reflection, Joe's, Joe Haynes' job was to uphold the relevance and reality of that boundary. And to me, that boundary didn't exist. So it, it's... But at the same time, we wouldn't have met and formed a very powerful friendship had that boundary not been there. So um, in my criticism of boundaries, also I'm constantly reminding myself that if there were no lines, we would lose a certain kind of um, gravity that these lines create. Uh, in talking with Carl before I, uh, earlier, he mentioned Robert Frost, Paul Mendingwall. Mendingwall may be one of the most famous pieces of literature about boundaries. <laughs> but in the, in the poem, two, two neighbors meet along a common stone wall in Vermont to mend the wall because the rocks fall off the wall in the winter. Um, things knock them over. The frost heats the ground. And at some point, one of, the, one of the voices in the poem asks the other, well, why are we doing this? What's the point? Like, we're not trying to keep livestock in or out. My pine cones aren't going to cross the stone wall and steal your acorns. Um, and the old Yankee neighbor says, because good fences, good, good fence, good fences. Fences make good neighbors. Good fences make good neighbors or something. <laughs> um, and it, it's sort of like a, a little bit of a throwaway comment. It's, you know, just because, because walls are important. But, and we can think of walls as things that separate, but really um, walls have another kind of beauty in that they, they brought the two people together to have a conversation in the first place. Uh, one of the main kind of, so this is a sort of thread or inquiry that's run through my work my entire life. I started painting these trout as a kid. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I did this book on trout as a um, 19 or 20 years old. It came out 
But it started with this insane, inexplicable love for these fish. I, I cannot tell you, and I can't even resurrect what that love was like. And Carl talked about a love between an individual owl and himself. I, I fished in my local stream, the Mill River, so much and photographed every fish that I caught that I actually knew these fish as individuals. They, I, one day, maybe after four or five years fishing there and looking at the photos, I was like, wait a second, this isn't just another brook trout. This is the same fish. I actually caught this fish and released it two years ago because the spotting patterns are like fingerprints. And I caught it behind the same rock. They're, they're territorial, you know, so I don't think I'll ever achieve that level of um, intimacy with nature again because of all the distractions in adult life. But I lived at that time in, in such a close um, relationship with my local environment that I, I dare say, <laughs> and could be criticized for this, but that it was al almost bordered on like the spiritual or even maybe something that an indigenous person would have um, would have felt because I also depended on that environment at a time in my life as a kid when you know, my family life was falling apart. It was it was my refuge. It was everything to me. And partly why I think I painted these things is because um, in in drawing them there was this level of devotion that like I wanted to become them or get into their skin there. I don't know. I can't I can't really explain it, but for whatever reason I started painting them and I couldn't find a book on the trout of North America um, equivalent to, you know, a field guide of whatever. Um, it didn't exist in the local library. This was before the internet, so if it wasn't in the library it didn't exist. So I started writing letters to departments of wildlife around the country asking, you know, what kind of fish live in, in Nevada or Wyoming, and, and I got very, I would write to, you know, a handwritten letter at 13 to the Nevada Department of Fish and Game, and get very nice letters back from people who, as it turned out, studied a particular type of fish their entire lives, the, the Humboldt cutthroat trout of the, you know, Humboldt River drainage in Nevada. And I started making the list of all the different types of trout in North America, but I learned very quickly that no two biologists could agree on how many species there were. And not only could they not agree on how many species there were, they couldn't agree on what a species even was. Um, and there's many working definitions of what a species is. So I, I learned at around 12 or 13, I sort of lost faith in the reliability of names to, to sort of describe and catalog the diversity of, of the natural world. And what that meant was that I also realized that, that we can't lean too much on language because it's just a tool. It's a tool that we impose on the natural world. But the natural world can't be fit into neat little boxes. It's messy. It's multifarious. It's in a constant state of change. What we basically do with language and naming is we create a map. And, and the map is used to navigate the world. But the map can't be expected to be the world that it's describing. It's just a representation of that world. I'll take a sip of water. Sorry. Um, and that. Um, in the process of naming and ordering nature to communicate it, to have a map to navigate. What naming does is it takes an interconnected holistic continuum and we have to draw lines between things and label the pieces. So there's an element of fragmentation and also reduction of, of beauty and diversity. So these are, this is a fish from Slovenia, this is from Japan. Um, and then after, you know, grappling with these thoughts about <coughs> how we name and order nature. I wanted to kind of make work that was um, expressing some of the ideas that I was thinking about. And some of the first works I made that weren't just literal representations of, of these trout were these hybrid creatures. Walt talked about hybrids. But what's amazing and beautiful about the idea of hybridity is it brings two things that weren't sort of otherwise connected together. And you create something that, for at least a moment, isn't named until somebody names it. But these were these were supposed to be sort of pages like from a quack naturalist notebook who seen two pieces of animals and put them together, or animals that have become their names and in um, in process protest of being named like a parrotfish or a turtle dove. Um, that's a passenger pigeon with a box turtle shell. Um, but the the uh, my passion for trout resulted in this first book of the trout of North America. Then I did a book on the trout of. Europe and Asia and North Africa. 
and it, it brought me to some places that I wouldn't ordinarily have gone to, like the headwaters of the Euphrates River or the Tigris in southeast Turkey, and places that were politically turbulent too. The, the Kurdish people were fighting in the Turkish military in southeast Turkey. Um, and we documented some of the first trout from these regions, us being mostly myself and an Austrian baker named Johannes Schuffman, who I, in a roundabout way, found and he became sort of my close friend and we traveled together for like seven years in different parts of Central Asia and uh, the Northern Hemisphere looking for native trout. This is in Northern uh, Hokkaido, uh, North Island of Japan. Um, this is a Mongolian rental car. <laughs> um, this is a Mongolian boy holding an Arctic grayling. We would just show up in an area and sort of the only word we would learn was the word for trout or whatever <laughs> fish we were looking for. In Turkish, it's alabalik and Italian trota. And we would just say alabalik or whatever, you know. <laughs> and, they, and sometimes a little boy would just show up out of the middle of nowhere holding a fish. Like they wanted to, they wanted to help us. But what I learned was that if there's water, there's usually fish and there's usually people in the, in the area connecting to those animals. So, uh, and I believe strongly in, in the idea that historically predation, the predator-prey relationship is, is more than just attaining food. It's a, it's a very intimate spiritual relationship that almost borders on love. We know that love is a force that connects us all, um, as we saw with the owl and, and Carl. And, and, and love fights against the fragmentation and the disconnection in the world. But I knew as a kid, because I loved fishing for these things so much, that there was something more, I was also letting them go, but there was this thrill in, in, in interacting with these fish, in part because I now realize that the way I talk about it is it was kind of like a communication through representation. So I was making these little sculptural objects uh, flies, you've probably seen or heard of fishing flies or use them, but basically you tie fur and feathers to a hook to try to make a, a, a sculpture of an insect or a representation that the fish will also think looks like an insect. So if you cast this and pre present it well in a stream and you think it's behaving like an insect should and a fish moves out of its sort of daily activities to look at your little representation of an insect your brain and that fish's brain are, are really connecting over this, this little simulation of nature. And a lot of communication, I would argue all of communication is done through representation. So I was engaging in a form of representation to communicate my love of trout to humans by painting them. And then I was, I was also communicating with the fish by making imitations of the things they ate. Anyway, um, uh, if you, become interested in naming, in ordering nature. Carl showed the, the Aristotelian um, sort of hierarchy of nature and classification. You eventually bump into, in, the, in Western culture, the Adam and Eve story. Um, Adam, Adam's first task from God was to, in Genesis, put names on all the animals. And a lot of people have said that this was sort of an act of, uh, of dominion over, over the animals. That, you know, once, once the animals are named, if they were previously unnamed, they become an entity that's separate and divided from us. And one of my favorite um, naming-related stories is by Ursula Wynn, a science fiction writer. It's just a beautiful one-page story called She Unnames Them, where Eve goes through the garden unnaming everything that Adam named. And when she's done, she hands her own name back to Adam and walks out of the garden in protest because she felt that um, in naming the animals it created this this sort of divide and when the animals were unnamed they could be back together again. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great story, I recommend it. This is a piece I did at the Yale University Art Gallery where I was combining objects from the, um, the Art Gallery and the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale to make commentaries about this idea of connectivity and the, the fragmentation and, and drawing lines between things in nature is, is a largely artificial enterprise. So I took about 250 bird specimens out of the Peabody Museum and pinned them to the wall on the color spectrum because drawing this parallel between the, the sort of indivisibility of the color spectrum and the indivisibility of the evolutionary continuum. You can draw lines, we have to draw lines 
and label the pieces in order to communicate. But we also should step away and realize that those lines are all ultimately fictional. Even though, yes, I'm different than a maple tree, but we're all connected in another sense in a, in a living ecosystem, but in the omni evolutionary continuum. <laughs> red or yellow are also colors that we just divide out of the spectrum and put labels on but really a spectrum is an undivided continuum uh, it was also an opportunity to just play with dead birds and make something pretty uh, but i juxtaposed this with some works by helen frank Toller and other people but there's also this incredible written record on the labels of all the people who collected these birds around the world over the last 150 years yale has about 150,000 specimens and believe it or not, it was hard to find enough, um, not green, but blue is the hardest color to sort of fill. Um, I don't want to talk too long. How, how much longer? Because we're stretching people's patience. We're enjoying it. Well, another, maybe another 10. Another 10? Oh, that much? Okay. Can you guys tolerate that? Sure. Okay. Thank you for I'll take another sip of water. Um, and then we'll go out into the lobby for the book signing. Mm -hmm. Give everybody a chance to okay. see it. I'll try to do less than that. I also, as part of this naming inquiry, I've tried to engage in the kind of historical process of naming. What, when you name things traditionally on biological expeditions, you have to kill them first. So there's this sort of element of possession and control. Mm -hmm. So I've accompanied biological expeditions with the Peabody Museum. The ornithology collections manager is one of my closest friends. But we put together this trip to central Suriname, uh, north of Brazil, former Dutch Guiana, to because there hadn't been a biological expedition in this particular area. If you want to find things and name them, you try to go places where people haven't gone because if people come there, everything has names. So the main, other than the highest peak in Suriname, most of the mountains don't have names, the river valleys don't have names. A lot of stuff is nameless. So we were collecting birds and I was painting them um, with nets and guns. We, we helicoptered into the forest for three weeks and. And we had a generator with a um, run by gas, a power generator, and we put out a light at night to attract moths. And there's, there's probably never been a light out after dark in that region other than the moon. So we had layers and layers of moths wow. on both sides of the sheet. Wow. And the, the largest moth in the center is the white witch moth, which has arguably the largest wingspan of any insect in the world. But nobody's found the, the caterpillar. So there's, there's still these great mysteries out there, and one of my lifelong, hopefully, boondoggles, if I have enough time left, is to try to find the caterpillar of the white witch moth. Wow. But they're about 12 inches long. They call them white witch moths because early collectors um, of birds and things would see them flying and think they're a bird, and they'd shoot their shotguns, and the pellets would go right through their wings, and they'd keep flying. So they thought they were. <laughs> but they're magnificent creatures, and when you see them fly out of the darkness onto a white sheet, they. Uh, they fly in such an erratic way. They'll, it's like when you throw a football and it hits the ground and it goes boing, boing, boing. It's just like like 10 feet each way. It's, it's totally crazy. But I love, I love doing these sort of direct research observational things, partly because it's part of the history of natural history collection, colonialism, everything that's good and bad about the planet. It's, it's rich material to write about and make work about. There's plenty of venomous snakes, and we dispatched some for you know, collection purposes. And I had fresh material to, to paint. Like Audubon describes, you know, that when an animal first dies, it's and, that, and as I've observed with fish over the years, they lose their colors very quickly. And that even that also happens with birds. A certain life glow disappears from their body, the tissue around their eyes, the beaks. Um, but anyway. Uh, these are just some, uh, this is another installation view of this, this show I did at the art gallery where I had an opportunity to put together like a Taurosaurus skull with a Barbara Hepworth sculpture just for fun because they look the same. And, the, and this, is a, this is a piece I did sort of commenting on how humans like order in nature. It's called the myth of order. We like neat geometry. We like things in, in boxes, but we have to accept the fact that na nature is sort of messy. Um, in terms of connectivity beyond language, I've I found over the years I've really been interested in animals that kind of trespass up, across boundaries, like the American eel reproduces in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but it spends its adult life in fresh water. So it's crossing this boundary that we perceive as being there, 
the, the shore between land and sea, but really it's a permeable, very permeable boundary. Um, those are baby eels. We wrote a book about eels. They get more pigmented as they get older. And obviously the enemy of connectivity are, are boundaries and barriers. This is the largest earthen dam in the North Island of New Zealand. This is what happens when eels on their downstream migration go through uh, hydro power turbines. They get chopped up in pieces. So a lot of times they can get up because they're incredible climbers, but on the way down they end up getting killed. So this, this results in a huge loss of habitat. Carl mentioned the decline of birds. I mean, the population of eels has declined, some people think, 90%. And you can see that with the original range of the freshwater eel, and it's been completely fragmented and destroyed because the habitat's not available because of, largely because of dams. And I've made works with eels taking a dead eel, putting ink on it, stamping it over and over, trying to express also the, the reproductive history of the eels, completely a mystery. Thankfully, nobody's ever witnessed eel spawning in the Sargasso Sea, so I tried to make these works imagining what this, this they call it a panmixia, a giant orgy of eels looks like in the ocean when they all aggregate to spawn, because because like all fish, they they spawn with external fertilization, they have to be close enough to, so the when they release the sperm and eggs that they, they get fertilized. Um, another boundary that I've engaged in in an exhibition is the boundary around Yellowstone National Park, which was created in 1872 by Ferdinand Hayden, a geologist, working with a painter named Thomas Moran and William Henry Jackson. They convinced Congress to set this aside as the first national park in the world. And that's great, but there are migrati migratory animals. These are all herds of elk that spend the summer in that Yellowstone and then migrate outside the park completely in the winter. Each herd is maybe six to 8,000 animals. We did this show at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West called Invisible Boundaries with myself, an ecologist named Arthur Middleton, and a, a photographer named Joe Reese. And you know, barbed wire bar fences are another impediment, like dams or walls. Now they have most most fences. They require the bottom rung to be barb free because pronghorn is go under fences, not over them usually. There's a lot of other stories like these migratory moths that they they spend the they they emerge in the Great Plains from um, alfalfa fields and stuff. They're called army coupler moths, and so they originate in Kansas and Nebraska, but they fly up into the high country in Wyoming and Montana in the summer above tree line. And they um, they're in the summer they're seventy percent of the diet of grizzly bears in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So you wouldn't you wouldn't expect that a food source for grizzly bears is coming from Kansas and Nebraska, and if they kill all those moths, um, potentially the grizzlies will come down and try to eat <coughs> more people. Um, anyway, more, more hybrids, <laughs> domestic and wild. Um, there are natural barriers in, in nature, obviously. Um, this is the lower falls of the Yellowstone. Historically, fish couldn't get up these barriers, but actually trout cross over the continental divide from the Pacific side. So there are trout in the headwaters of the, the Yellowstone River but they came from the Pacific. There's a lot of things I won't be able to talk about because there's not much time, but I've been doing these sort of flags, realizing that flags, our flags are mostly grids and boundaries, like the American flag, a couple stars, but nothing organic or related to nature. So I've been making some of these flags that show animals crossing the boundaries, and in this case, bison and big blue stem and grass. This is a show I have up in Fort Worth, Texas about prairies, and prairies are, Prairies and grasslands are ecosystems that require um, to be healthy uh, forces that don't obey boundaries. One of them is fire, and another is traditionally massive herds of grazing animals. Both of those are, are dead or suppressed, so that's why there's almost no remnant prairies left. They've been gridded and developed and, and, and plowed. And uh, finding a little piece of remnant grassland is like going back in time because it is, a, it is essentially a time capsule. This is one case. Um, sometimes the only place you can find these old rare prairie grasses and, and flowers are in old cemeteries where they started burying people when the prairies were still there and they never plowed them because there were dead people buried there. Some of them have wooden headstones. Um, this is my friend Matt White who took me there. They call them cemetery prairies. He pulled one of these um, post oak or, or, or bodark wood 
head stones up to just show me that they're rot resistant. This is in Missouri. But, and then I made these works that have the flowers and grasses sort of crossing the boundaries between the pieces of paper as a, as a sort of expression of trespassing. That one in the form of a cross because of, of um, and I, I planted a little native prairie on our property. Um, and last winter, oh, that's yellow Indian grass, which is beautiful grass. I, uh, I set fire to it without asking anybody permission, but it's, uh, that's, I could talk at length about the importance of fire and grasses, but there's no time for that. But I made these works of these like logs cast in bronze with these flowers I made out of clay coming out of them, just to express the resilience of nature in, in the face of these necessary traumas. So the, the trauma of being eaten, grazed, and, and being burned are what keep these things alive. That's a self-portrait as a burned log in bronze. <laughs> Um, anyway, and those are burned bits. I, I guess I'll just end with this. Um, this is the uh, the native range of the lesser prairie chicken. And if you if you notice in New England and Long Island where we are, there were prairie chickens. They were called heathens. This is one from the uh, Peabody Museum collection in, at Yale, and um, that tells us that there were and early accounts from colonists that. A lot of New England was not forest, it was a grassland, and that's because the indigenous people burned the crap out of everything to create more habitat for grazing animals. Books like William Cronin's Changes in the Land or Stephen Pine's Fire in America really make that very clear. There, of course there were forests, but it was, there were a lot of mixed forests and savannas. Um, more grass meant more habitat for deer, which meant, and, and elk and bison, which meant they were inflating the population of these animals because they relied on them for food. Um, so anyway, I think I'll stop there. These deer are trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of, uh, yeah.